do. Apparently. Oh, it says we're live. Hey, we're back. Are we back? We're going to pretend we're back. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where we got cut off there. Uh, I was giving a great introduction for Robert Singletary and what you did here. I'm not sure where I left off on that, but it was a doggone good introduction. <laughs> yeah, Robert Singletary, what a, what a value he is to our community and so many fun stories and things we've learned from Robert and his walking tours. And uh, Robert's going to come up and talk a little bit about... We have oh, a video. Oh we, oh, we have a video. Oh, even better. We have a video. We'll see if we can get that thing ready. And trust me, I'm not touching any of the buttons. Chance to go inside. Says the live So that's one of our tours. And then we do a tour of downtown. We, we take a look at the, the beach area and where, where, the, where the resorts were built, where the steamboats were docked many years ago. It was a beautiful setting. And so we take people from that setting where the, where the resort is currently, the Kirtland Resort. And then we take them down about five or six blocks of downtown and talk about how the town got started. Before it developed first, and then right on right on top of that, the town developed. So a lot of our buildings that go all the way back to the early 1900s are still there and still in use. So, and we'll take you down to maybe where we started some of the very, the early uh, residential sections where Mr. Blackwell, who was one of our first pioneers, came in and built a beautiful home. And his son's house is still there. We can, we can take a look at it. So, we try to do that. The tours, actually, we try to start the tours right at the beginning of the summer and try to go through September. And then uh, we do the special tours. We normally do the tours once the tours are on tours at 11 o'clock in the morning and the uh, downtown tours at 1.30 in the afternoon. But we all do special tours. If you've got some other organization that, that won't fit you, we can do special tours. It said we were live on YouTube. So, no, I didn't make that. No. So I'm, I just stopped it and I'm starting it again. Wi Fi. Yay, Wi Fi. <laughs> we'll have fiber at the new museum. We're, we're back on? Are you going to be able to pull a video up this time? Yeah. Okay. 
I said, you know, we were talking earlier about Morse code and the telegraph. It might have been smoke signals we could have worked with. So technology, we will catch up with it. It's an, it's an ever, everyday learning experience for me, I know. So uh, we'll get through this. Uh, I'm going to go back talk about Robert just for a moment. I don't know where we got cut off. Great guy. You know, he came up here, Mr. History. I love listening to him talk. I love when he dresses up and personifies people out of history. He went uh, as two different characters on the Lewis and Clark uh, uh, recreation. He doesn't just walk the walk, he talks the talk, he does, he goes it all, he learns from the inside out. There's a video that we have and he gives tours around down and it's really neat for people to come in, even if you don't know, uh, you know much about it, you don't have to be a tourist to come down and, and learn from one of these walking tours. So I'm gonna let Britt try to find the right button and we're gonna see if this thing pulls up and gets this cool little video going for you. So we are actually we are. Yeah, we are. going to have Robert oh, come up and talk to us that. live. So we don't have to deal with technology. We'll just hear it straight from the horse. Robert Singletary, live and in person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Technology doesn't always tech, does it? It's really a pleasure to be able to uh, talk about the history of this town, how it got started and share it with people all across the world because we get, we get people coming through here from all over the place. And they basically hear about, you know, people say, how do you really say the name of your town? And, and that's usually gets us started out. I said, well, if, if we're thinking about the early friends, it's more like Care de Lin. And most people say Coeur de Lin and all variations. But what I do on the tour, we have two tours <clears throat> that we do. We walk, leave the museum. One tour starts at 11 o'clock, uh, morning, Tuesday through Saturday. And we will be starting right about uh, first of the, uh, June, last of May, and going through September. And what we do in the morning at the, at the 11 o'clock tour is that we tour old Fort Kirtland, later on named Fort Sherman. And we talk about why we have a Sherman Avenue and why we had a Fort Sherman and the, and the role that, Fort, that, that <clears throat> General Sherman played in this town. So we, we, we really take people through three of the buildings that still left on the old fort, the fort grounds. And <clears throat> first one is we usually go into is the chapel, which has been there since 1880. And we talk about what went on in that chapel, that it was not only just a chapel where the soldiers went to worship, but it was also a place where it was actually one of the first schoolhouses because there were married uh, <clears throat> soldiers on the fort that had children and we had to have a school. So it was our first schoolhouse. And, and I'm really delightful when we have youngsters, we, we sit down and sort of pretend we're in our class at Old Fort Sherman. And so we, we view that building on that tour and then we take people through one of the officers' quarters that has been preserved by North Idaho College. It's actually uh, still used for the forts that still use as offices and classroom space. And we take uh, people through there and talk about this is where the one of the commanding officers lived before his beautiful home was built on the shore of the lake. So we talk about the history of that building. And then we take them to the powder magazine, which was the only brick building, out of some 53 buildings on the Fort Grounds. And we take them through that. And it's also a small museum, which has photos about the Kirtland tribe, about the Fort itself, and about the school that was built there. And so we talk about those three buildings on our tour. Then we, at uh, 1.30, we do a tour of the downtown. We take people from where they were seeing the shorelines where all the steamboats were built, where they left from and travel across. 
it's very late. Probably the most steamboat activity on any body of water west of the Mississippi River, right here. And we talk about that. We talk about what created the town of Coeur d'Alene. The old fort and Coeur d'Alene sort of grew up together. Fort came first. And as people moved in to serve the fort, a town was built. And so we take them downtown and talk about some of the buildings, what went on in the old downtown, uh, what buildings are still there. And so we give them an overview of what it was like living in Colonel Lane from the fort days to present time. So that's basically what I do. We, we, we do that, as I said again, we start usually around the 1st of June, end of, end of May, and take, do, our, do our tours right on to September. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Hey, like I say, a great opportunity if you, now that you know what he looks like, if you didn't know what he looks like before, next time you see him on Sherman Ave, you stop and ask him a question. I bet he'll have a great answer for you. Uh, it's a real treasure to have. As are our volunteers, they are a treasure to the museum as well. And Britt has a, a couple of awards for our uh, most valuable, vol is it MVV then? Yeah. I guess it's, it's new, most valuable volunteers perhaps. <laughs> So the museum is a nonprofit. We have two full-time employees, two part-time employees, definitely not enough hands to get everything done that we need to get done at the museum. So we turn to our volunteers for all of that work. And our volunteers do everything from working the guest service desk to uh, sell admissions and gift shop, to working in the back, digitizing and cataloging photos, working our special events, helping with administrative duties and then some of the special skills um, that we need help with constructing exhibits, doing research and the like. So our volunteers put in a lot of hours. Uh, they're very dedicated. We would not be able to run the museum without the volunteers. And so we thought that it was only fitting that we give our volunteers a little bit of recognition for all of their hard work. So this year we have most valued volunteer going to suspense. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> going to Deb Mitchell and Michelle Williams. <laughs> So Deb and Michelle have been absolutely invaluable help to the museum. Uh, when we were getting our new exhibit, Hollywood of the North put together, Deb and Michelle were working late night hours with me so we could get everything mounted and installed as we were getting our new gift shop uh, put in, finding new vendors, getting everything barcoded, getting everything stocked. Deb and Michelle were right there making sure that everything got done and displayed beautifully so that when we were able to open for the season, we had a phenomenal museum to showcase to the public. So Deb and Michelle, thank you so much for everything that you do for the museum. Uh, I don't know what I would be doing if it weren't for the two of you and the museum is definitely a better museum for your help. So thank you very much. It is musical chairs here tonight. Uh, we're gonna do a little break here and bear with us. We know we've had some uh, <clears throat> pause here, electronically and technologically. Stick with us, the best is yet to come. Uh, I'll take a little break and we've got a couple more things to give away here. And if we go off, hang with us, we'll be right back on. Um, we're trying to make sure our systems get so we can get the other program covered. Did you want to do a couple more awards, ladies? Yeah. Giveaway. Beautiful. Cordelain. Beautiful and progressive. It's, it's kind of an interesting town. You might want to read about it sometime. So. <laughs> yeah. Autograph copy. Autograph copy, no less. Yeah. Robert Singletary. Like another one, you know, the, the museum 
puts out, uh, we've got over two dozen books that are out and published, and I think that there's still more to come over the years. You'll see that. So it's a, kind of our own little publishing company here at the museum. And that's a great way to support the museum. Um, come on down, buy any kind of pieces of history. And there's some really, really neat books uh, of all kinds, covers a lot of different uh, subjects. Uh, but come down and check out the gift shop and the museum and say check out the uh, books because we have a lot of really, really neat ones. That uh, Coeur d'Alene, beautiful and progressive, it's an illustrated history of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Goes to? Nancy Young. Nancy Young. Nancy? Young. Nancy Young. I hope you haven't gotten too old. Yeah, Nancy, well, we've been going through this. But... <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, Nancy Young, you got a book coming, and, and, and if you if, if your name has popped up here, uh, connect, come down to the, to the museum or give them a call. Sometime we'll we'll get this to you. Uh, obviously, you can't reach through the screen and give it to you. So, uh, do we have anything else you want to give away? Or? No, we're just going to take a little break and switch computers. And Dr. Brandstetter, okay. we're yeah, we're going to yeah, hang on to this. We're going to do some a little adjusting of the microphone and, and a screen to get this great program on. So give us just a couple of minutes, and we'll be right back with the feature event of the season, the evening too. Yeah. There. Okay. Okay. I think I'm ready. So he's going to introduce you. So if you okay. want to mute all of your stuff so that we can unmute all of ours. Okay. So for him to introduce and then he'll mute and then you can unmute. Yourself. Gotcha. All right.
Are we on? Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome back. Okay. Told you I'm not touching the button, so. All right, we're back. Thank you so much uh, for that, hanging out. Uh, this is this is really fun for me. I've been kind of waiting for this. We talked about this a year ago and the old uh, upside down world that we've lived in prevented us. Uh, so it's great to have this finally come around our, pro, our presenter tonight. Uh, Dr. Heather Branstadter, and she's from Silver Valley originally, graduated summa cum laude from the University of Idaho before going on to earn a PhD in rhetoric and cultural studies from the University of North Carolina in 2012. Her academic research article uh, discussing the more notorious aspects of her hometown won the Charles Nepper Award for the most significant contribution to, to scholastic and sorry, in uh, scholarship in rhetoric in 2017. Uh, Dr. Branstetter has been a member of the Wall City Council since 2016, serves on the board of the Bernard Stockridge Museum up there as program director and is the executive director of the Historic Walls Preservation Society. If you haven't read her book, go out and get it. You can come down and get it at the library. It's a fascinating book. And I brought my copy to get personally autographed. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Heather Branstadter. This is gonna be a fun program. Here we go. Which button do I push? <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. Um, I think, yeah, I think, okay. Did you share your screen? <laughs> Not yet. All right, hopefully uh, this is working. It looks like it's still showing. There I am. Okay, sorry. Thanks for sticking with us through all of the technical problems tonight. We're on a 20 minute delay before we can see if it's actually, uh, working. <laughs> so um, go ahead and uh, just send me a text if you're having issues still. <laughs> we'll try and fix it. Um, so thanks so much to the Museum of North Idaho for inviting me. Uh, we were supposed to do this last year, but then of course COVID happened. So we're being flexible and um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, museums do so much for historians and I found this out firsthand um, when I went to write my book. Um, I checked in with the uh, mining museum in Wallace and they greatly helped my whole project. Um, and if it weren't for them, we probably wouldn't have the book that we have today. And, um, and so I really appreciate museums. Um, it's so important for us to be able to preserve our history. As you all know, um, probably anyway, Northern Idaho has had a huge influx of people, newcomers. Um, as you saw it earlier in the meeting tonight, everyone was touting their uh, homegrown credentials, <laughs> more important than PhDs. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, um, and part of, for part of that uh, reason is because we have a, a culture and a history that is so important to preserve. And, um, and that was a big reason you know, one of the main drivers of wanting to write the book was to um, preserve this very unique aspect of Wallace's history uh, that a lot of people um, know about, but probably won't know about in the next generation. In fact, some of the knowledge had already been lost by the time that I went to do the research. I had not heard of Dolores Arnold before I started doing this research, and yet she was the most famous madam um, in Wallace. Uh, and, you know, part of that was just I was very young when this all ended. And now this generation um, that's, you know, growing up now didn't have any of this knowledge at all. Because of course um, the FBI raid came along in 1991 and kind of put the final nail in the coffin of sex work in Wallace. Um, well, I am going to go ahead and show you our documentary. Um, it's based on part three of the book. So I, uh, designed the book to take place in three parts. Um, the first part is kind of an introduction or an overview uh, with a lot of the primary source materials. I used um, master's theses, I used oral histories that other people had done. 
Um, I read a bunch of books. I um, also did uh, primary source arch archival work in um, various special collections and um, also museums and people's basements. And um, I was so happy to hear that you'll have a fireproof archival room. That's exciting. We, uh, we lost, we lose things into to the fire all the time when they're just hanging out in people's houses and they catch on fire. So, um, so it's great to have some, some better preservation available. Um, and then part two, I kind of give my take on um, why uh, sex work lasted for so long in the Silver Valley and of course in Wallace in particular. Um, and I cover the reasons also a little bit in this uh, documentary, so I'll try not to spoiler any of it. Um, and then part three were oral histories. I did um, 99 oral histories. And since then I've, I've continued to, to do more um, that made it into the book at least. And um, I wanted these oral histories to really speak for themselves. So I didn't offer the reader much guidance. I wanted people to kind of get a feel for how um, the cadence of, of storytelling in, um, in the Silver Valley, which is unique. Um, Northern Idaho, I think even in the West, you can probably make generalizations about how people tell stories. And so I wanted to capture that. Also, the older generation tells stories differently from the younger generations as well. So, um, so those kind of speak for themselves and you'll hopefully hear some of that in this documentary as well. Um, it was directed by uh, Delaney Buffett. She found out about us through um, Atlas Obscura. Um, and she discovered us through Wallace, I mean, um, through the Oasis Bordello Museum article on Atlas Obscura. And sadly, the Oasis Bordello Museum is um, undergoing transition and they may not reopen um, unless somebody kind of like comes along and maybe has some deep pockets to <laughs> save it somehow. Um, so again, that's why it's so important to preserve local history. Um, you never know when it's gonna um, not be able to be funded. So um, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and click donate on the Museum of North Idaho's homepage and keep them alive and um, thriving and uh, subscribe to their uh, YouTube video uh, service as well. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll see if we can't get the um, Wallace documentary playing for you guys. Okay, I think it's playing. We'll see. Um, not hearing sound. Can you hear it in there? Sorry, guys. Was it that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Idaho line yeah, in Spokane. The traveler goes through okay. the Coeur d'Alene mine. Start it back over again now that we've got it working. <laughs> I'd like to read you something. Between Lookout Pass on the Montana-Idaho line and Spokane, the traveler goes through the Coeur d'Alene Mining District, which has been producing lead, zinc, silver, and gold continuously since the 1880s. The towns in this area are authentically colorful places with long histories extending back to the wild times of the last century most important. Anyone who fears that the exuberant spirit of the old Western mining camp is a thing of the past should cry Wallace on a Saturday night. I like that.
When I was growing up, I just thought every town had whorehouses. I didn't know it was different. It was just the way it was. They opened up in the middle of the afternoon after the girls would wake up, and then they would ring the doorbell, and whoever was responsible for answering the door would invite them in and put them in one of the parlors. And then whoever was awake or ready, they'd send the girls in to visit with the boys. And, and they'd say, uh, who wants to go play? So one of the boys would get up and say, well, I will. And they'd take them back to the room, and they'd ask them what they wanted. And Straight sex, or half and half, and or whatever you chose to do. And she'd have, it was not a written menu, but she would give you options. But we were kids, and we were poor, so we just did the $10 one most of the time. Get their money, come back in the kitchen, put it in their box, set their timer. Then when their minutes were up, ding, ding, I was knock, knocking. <laughs> time. Give you a couple of minutes, and out the door they'd come. They'd open the door and say, coming through. And they'd walk you out, either the back door or the front door. They were the cleanest place. I mean, they kept them spotless. The girls were checked every week by the doctor to me, and I never heard of any VD up there or anything. Did you ever have any interactions with the girls? Did I? Yeah. Well, certainly. I went there every Friday night after the football game. The cat houses, the houses of ill repute. There were five of them. There are Mint, the Oasis, the Jade, you and I were all on one street, and they all had neon signs. And it was against the law to have them, but so each of them um, paid a $500 a month fine to be there. Most Western towns, and mostly mining camps like Wallace, were pretty notorious for prostitution. You had a large male population, and uh, didn't take long for the women to get here. Wallace was a, a unique situation uh, in that it had Old West brothels that operated um, illegally, yet openly, um, for over a century, up until 1991. I worked in this one. It was the Armit Rooms. I worked in the Lux, which is the melodrama now. I worked in the Oasis, which is next door. And I worked in the Luxette, which is up to three. I worked in all of them. It was very challenging. When I got the job, I was working over here at Sweets Cafe, and I was getting tired of being slinging that old hash, you know? So the cab driver, he says, well, Dee says, they need a maid upstairs. I said, I'm not gonna do that. What's the matter with you? I'm not going up there. He said, it's not like you think it is. I said, oh dear. So, okay, I'm a gutsy old broad anyway, you know, so I'll try anything once. I worked as a maid. Yes, when my parents, I came home from my first year of college and my mother decided that I didn't live by the family rules and so she booted me out and they said I had to get a job. And so I got a job. I was coming to work one day and the madam says, Dee, would you take this gentleman a glass of iced tea and blah, blah, room? I did, and I come back and sat down at the kitchen table and she goes, well, that's a load man. I go, oh, okay, that's nice. She says, you don't know what that is. I go, well, sure I do. I didn't want to think I was stupid. <laughs> but anyway, this girl was across the hall and she was making whoopee with this guy. Well, as soon as he come in her, she had to get up and run across the hall, and that guy ate her out. That's your load man, hon. I said, how do you girls do that? She said, just put some dollar signs in your eyeballs. And I go, oh, great, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. When I stand in the boogie band. Yep. To them, it was just a job. 
and then they would go home on their one week off once and go see their families. A lot of them had children, husbands. And some of them were working for their education. A lot of them wanted the same as the rest of, you know, a home and a family and a husband and all of this, but it wasn't time for them. And I would just sit and talk, and it's time it'll happen, you know. Yeah. It was, a, I'm sure, a lonely existence. And uh, yeah, whoring ain't easy, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't think. They did all kinds of things to, uh, I've got paintings around here. The, they did a little of everything to kind of pass the time. Yeah, no, they weren't supposed to. They weren't supposed to go out and be in the public. And I think that's probably the reason why it worked so well for so many years was because they did, it was, they went to the doctor, they did their phone calls, and then once a month they went on a vacation. They were good women, they were, but they kept their place when they were here. Yep. And it was all above board. There wasn't any BS going on. That's why I think they lasted up there because of the old time madams that ran it like it was a business. The madams, you know, there was only a few that I knew. Uh, Dolores, of course, everybody talks about Dolores. She was a, a pretty classy gal. Dolores, when they built the Civic Auditorium, Dolores put the first $10,000 up to build that. Well, you know how much 10 grand was back there then? I mean, that was an unbelievable amount of money. The madams were just really good about figuring out what exactly the community required in order to support the business and in order to continue to support the business. There was also this civic contribution angle that came into play where um, if anyone wanted to say, oh, they, the houses threaten marriages and families and the kids, um, then, you know, the madams would come back with, well, we're good for families, we're good for kids. We save more marriages than the clergy do. You know, that's what one thing that Dolores was said to have um, said. Sometimes people don't realize how good the houses were to the city. Uh, they bought, uh, I think it was six, 1968, bought the high school band uniforms. But yeah, this is definitely um, one of the ones that the madam paid for, for the, for the Wallace High School band. And to look at it, you can bet this was not a cheap uniform. They were always very generous with uh, supporting activities in the area. My first year here, I had a very precocious fifth grade class. And one young man one day walked up and said, Mrs. Kuntz, would you please buy some raffle tickets for junior league football? And I said, oh, sure, you know, I'll buy one. And he goes, just one? I said, OK, I'll buy two. And he looks at me and he goes, Mrs. Coons, the ladies at the butt huts buy at least 10. The great thing about the madams is, um, and as a woman, I, I really respect their business sense. And I really respect their public relations, because had they not bought uniforms and, and done wonderful things for Halloween trick-or-treat and put out money for those things, they would have been much less accepted in this valley and in this town by, by a lot of people. No, it wasn't for business. Not at all. She did it because she wanted to, because she has that kindness in her heart. She did. 
But that was public relations, pure and simple. There is no such thing as a madam with a heart of gold. That's just bullshit. On June 6, 1991, there was the biggest FBI raid in the history of the, I'm going to say, Northwest, OK? And the FBI likes to say how they ran prostitution on a wall. So that really isn't true. It's good to let them say that, but they left on their own. They, they left right before they actually had their big raid. They were already all closed. AIDS put them out of business. That's what Tanya told me. She said she was closing up shop because the people were running scared, and the girls were running scared, and they didn't like wearing double condoms on the guys, you know, said, why would they pay for that? And so why they just decide they'd close them down. And... I actually kind of miss them here. I really do. They, they, it's not my cup of tea, of course, but they kept us safe here. I don't know, it just seemed better than somebody walking the streets or pulling somebody into the alley. Yeah. But uh, it was just something that we accepted, and, and we kind of uh, was glad that it was there. We never had to worry about any rapes or molestations. And they did a great service for the community. And all the little high school girls that didn't get knocked up because their boyfriends could go up there for five bucks, and it saved a lot of problems. And I heard someone say um, that we were so lucky that we didn't get raped. Well, that's not true. There were rapes in walls, and um, and there were date rapes, and that the reason and that boyfriends didn't get their girlfriends pregnant because they had the outlet of the prostitute. Well, I was 16. There were condoms on the corner. There were prostitutes upstairs. I got pregnant at 16. One of the reasons I was going to decline this interview is because I know that my story is a very personal one. And, um, and, it, was, and it was because of pro proximity. And I know so many other of my friends and my classmates were not affected in this way. My son, um, I had taught, I so wanted him not to turn out like his dad. And, uh, and I talked to him at great length about, I said, I know you're gonna have sex soon when he was about 14, 15. And I said, um, just want you to be really like that girl and don't push yourself on her. Don't you ever push yourself on a girl because she will hate you eventually. And, um, and I want you to, I want you to feel, have feelings for her. And I want it to be a good experience for you. And then, I think he was, so I, I invested so much in that kid. And um, I got a phone call when he was up in Spokane visiting his dad, and it was from his dad. And he went, <laughs> honey, well, your, your, your boy became a man. And he'd taken him up to the whorehouse. If I was married, yeah. I'd rather have my husband go to the rooms where he's being with somebody who yeah is not going to come out and see us together and be like, oh, I haven't seen you forever. So yeah. as a single person, but younger, I would say I wouldn't care if my husband went up there because at <laughs> least he's not cheating on me with some girl from the bar. The things that people generally say to promote it and to say what a great thing it is, and they run it up a flagpole and salute it, prostitution and Wallace, yeah. Um, I feel it was damaging. And I still, I still feel that way, and I'm not a prude. Wallace, the way it was, was normal. And I speculate that kids growing up in Las Vegas right now, that's normal to them. The casinos are normal. The prostitution is normal. Whatever they do there, it's later that you realize, whoa, that was different. This community in this valley, Kellogg, Wallace, and Mullen, and all the little communities as well, 
you know, uh, I've always been very, very independent. Some people might want to say, hey, that's crooked, that's wrong, you're not supposed to do that, but uh, we did it for a lot of years and we did it very well. But prostitution, uh, it's, it, it makes me laugh to think that a society <laughs> that's had something going on since its beginning, uh, you know, uh, still keeps it in the closet. It's just crazy. I think we're back, hopefully. Um, so uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, as you can see, we tried to show kind of like an even-handed presentation. It, it's really hard actually to find people who will speak uh, against um, sex work. Uh, one of our comments said, um, what did the churches say about it? They are generally the other uh, negative voice that um, people would discuss, but um, but even then they were, they did seem to be okay with it because, um, basically even when people were members of the, uh, church and also influential in town politics, uh, they did not, um, choose to, uh, you know, get rid of the sex work because, um, the city leaders, uh, the mayor, they all knew that if they tried to end it, that, you know, then they would just elect people who, you know, would bring it back. <laughs> so the town and, um, had enough of a uh, majority that was in favor of it, that there was just no political will for doing anything else about it. And um, since uh, Northern Idaho was so powerful in state politics um, at, at that time, um, because of the amount of money that we had from silver, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't really anything to tip the balance against it um, at the broader level either um, for a really, really long time. So when they say econ the economy affected it, it affected it in multiple ways. Um, so uh, I guess I would like to open it up for questions from um, board members, if they are interested in asking them. Um, yeah, is it Courtney? Courtney. So the film Oh, right. Yeah. So um, this is kind of a process question as well as um, uh, what the differences were between the book research and the documentary research. So um, what we ended up doing uh, was I recorded um, oral histories for um, most everyone. Um, who I talked to for my book research. And then um, when Delaney came in and she and I and um, Jocelyn Foyles who runs the, the Lux Rooms, um, which is also a former brothel that now you can go stay in. It's been, um, they preserved some of it actually. And it, the remodel happened before Jocelyn and Matthias took over. But so she helped a lot as well. Um, Cause I was also working a job at the time. And um, we just kind of did a whirlwind filming for I think it was three days. <laughs> In total. Um, and uh, we talked to a lot of the people who I talked to for um, the book, but then we also talked to a few other people. There was one woman who told me something that she had never, who told us something that she had never told me individually. And she also didn't do it on camera for the documentary, of course, because as anyone knows, um, a lot of the best 
stuff happens before and after, uh, you know, the recording is rolling. And she was talking about how she paid for her um, future husband to go up and lose his virginity in um, the houses because they both figured that somebody needed to know what they were doing up there. <laughs> And we were like, oh, wow, you should have said that on camera. Let's bring it back. And she's like, nope. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, Dave Albertini, I talked to, um, he was the one who was um, saying that he went up there every, you know, Friday night after the football game. He, he I believe he's still working at the um, Hilltop restaurant over in Kingston. If you guys want to go um, to dinner there, you can hear some of his stories. Uh, I think he lives around here, actually. Um, but, uh, so he told some different stories. So you, we did get to hear some, uh, new material, new content for the documentary as opposed to the book, but a lot of it was also overlapping. I, and I knew Holly was, um, the woman who, uh, kind of told her more personal story. Um, I, I knew from talking with her earlier that she'd had a negative experience with it. Um, and I suspected that she might be willing to share it because um, even some people who had had negative experiences were not as willing to share on screen either. And um, I kind of, I kind of had to talk her into it a little bit. So it, it took a lot of bravery, I think, for her to kind of uh, get on and and share that other perspective with us. But um, but of course, it's really important to have that um, to have that present, even if it was um, a more minority viewpoint. Jocelyn, are you going to come up to the mic? Well, no, uh, I'm not going to get in your space. It's just, uh, I'm going to repeat some of the questions. Oh, okay. So the, sure. because they can't hear, the people at home can't hear us in the gallery. Right. So I'm hoping they can hear me if I'm, I don't want to be up on the camera. But. Oh yeah, I tried to do that. Sorry uh, if I did it ineffectively. <laughs> so uh, my question is, I heard that the madams didn't always take cash that sometimes they were taking like stock uh and shares in the mines and, and other forms of payment yeah um so i didn't hear about the uh stock but i'm i would not be surprised if that happened um i did hear that the madams would take uh, diamond drill bits mm -hmm. as payment um of course the miners drill with using real diamonds in their drill bits. And um, so the, it was rumored that um, the madams did accept that as payment. Um, the mine owners were of course not super happy about that. So I don't think that that was very common either, but I did hear that that happened. Um, so. uh, another person wants to know how long the FBI was involved. It, did, was it a raid and a leave or, or were they like, did they stick around for a while? Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's surprising to me actually that this, the more recent part of the history was the, for me, some of the more difficult um, details to sort through the truth and the um, false falsehood. It seems like um, the further back in history you get kind of the more secure narrative that you find. But um, the more recent stuff was a little trickier. Um, I did a FOIA request um, to, to gain access to the documents from the FBI about the raid. Uh, there's so many that um, they were like, well, it's going to take some years to do this. So we suggest you do a, uh, it's like a medium length request, which was up to a thousand pages. And that took a year and a half um, to receive. So it did, none of that material made it into this book. Um, and hopefully it will make it into um, a forthcoming book. Uh, <laughs> but that material um, features the prosecutorial report from a two year long um, undercover investigation. Um, it might've been even longer. I haven't completely finished going through all of it, as you might imagine. Um, but it, and a lot of it is also heavily redacted. Um, but they were they arrived around the time that the women from the Oasis uh, left. Um, so the story that the Oasis tells is that the women figured out that there were undercover FBI agents here in town, or there was some like scuffle that happened between within the sheriff's department here locally. And then they came over um, to the FBI office here in Coeur d'Alene 
or perhaps Spokane, um, depending on who's telling the story. And then <laughs> also, hopefully I'll have these details sorted out by the next book. Um, but what happened was uh, they got wind of, of, of this undercover investigation. Um, other people say nobody had any idea that the raid was happening. So <laughs> I can't really sort through, you know, where the truth is on that. But, um, but it does seem kind of strangely coincidental that um, that that house shut down around that time. <clears throat> and then Dolores owned uh, two houses and she became um, ill. Um, I think she came down with Alzheimer's around that uh, same time, 86 or so. Uh, the Oasis shut down in 88. I wanna say that Dolores was around <clears throat> 87. And then, um, and then the, you and I, continued to run, as um, Christy said, up until like two weeks before the raid happened. So the raid happened in um, June 23rd um, of 1991, and they left around the time, uh, the, the very beginning of June. And people also say that, um, well, one woman in particular said that uh, one of the guys had mentioned that he'd tipped off one of the girls or one of the girls had mentioned to her that she'd been tipped off by one of the guys that their a raid was going to happen and that they must have kept it very quiet to themselves because it was i mean according to most accounts a surprise when all the agents came over the hill <laughs> and uh in force and in uh dick karen he gets it mostly right it was the biggest raid in the history of the whole rocky mountain region so yeah it was um it was called overkill quite a bit in the papers. <laughs> and of course the FBI wasn't on everyone's top five list at that time after Waco and Ruby Ridge. So um, it was around that time. There's two questions about the Wallace police involvement, uh, if yeah. they'd ever raided separately. And then another person uh, suggesting that the former sheriff's deputy was participating with the FBI in the raid as a retaliation. So I know those are two <laughs> separate questions, but uh, yeah. Um, so I, uh, I spoke with um, the lawyer who represented Sheriff Sinkovich in, in the trial. And um, he, he made it out like Sinkovich was simply doing what people expected him to do as an elected official and um, that he was trying to do it as best he could. Uh, and that their argument, um, which was a successful one in court, was that, you know, you can't come in and prosecute one man and try to convict one man for something that's been deeply embedded in the culture of a town and a community for over a hundred years. Um, and of course, the, the sex workers were not the, the main target of the FBI raid, the gambling was, and then in order well, the sheriff was. And then in order to get him under the RICO Act, they had to have two different kinds of corruption under, um, under the law. And so they had to prove that there was corruption both uh, on gambling and something else. And they were looking for either drugs or sex work. Um, and so that was why they kind of involved the sex workers in it where um, they weren't really the main target. Um, and yeah, supposedly this all came about because um, one of the sheriff's deputies um, was known to have cooperated with the FBI. Um, they called him Wireman Shireman. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he's of course redacted from the official like prosecutorial report, but you can kind of figure out like him and also um, Merrill Field. They call him they called him Squirrely Murley. Um, <laughs> so lots of great nicknames because uh, a lot of people were really bitter and upset about this, right? Like this is people's livelihoods. Um, but um, when I talked with Merrill um, before he passed, um, he told me, you know, he lost two hundred thousand dollars. It was, you know, devastating to him, like personally. It, it wasn't it wasn't a good deal for him either. It's not like he was gaining anything. It sounds like he was kind of like just trying to make the best decisions that he could make too. So yeah, um, it's the, the raid is a very contentious, I think, subject uh, that it's probably difficult to deal with in a quick question and answer session. <laughs> but hopefully, I mean, maybe people write in, like tell us your stories, tell, tell me your stories, um, give me an email uh, and let's, let's hear more perspectives. Mugshots, 
Yeah, so he's asking um, that if some of the pictures were mug shots of the girls, and that's right. Um, in fact, uh, that was a huge find. Um, and that was brought to me by um, then Sheriff uh, Mitch Alexander. And he had all these files in his basement um, uh, that looked like that. Um, and I, I could probably I could probably share a little bit here. Um, there's some more that I have on, on my computer, but um, you can go through and see their rap sheets on there. Let, let me go ahead and pull that up if I can. Let me do a share screen. not like that. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if I can get to it. Um, so each of the women um, had to be registered with the sheriff's department, and then they did an FBI background check on every single woman from, um, and we have records as a result of Mitch Alexander's um, donation, um, which they're now kept in the mining museum. Um, but I digitized all of them. Um, we now have records from 19, beginning around 1952 and going all the way up until 1973, um, which was when there was a change in FBI policy. And, um, and so then the sheriff's department stopped keeping, keeping the records. So they start uh, with Wallace Police Department. And then when Wallace moved to Shoshone County Sheriff's, they went um, to there. And apparently um, Sheriff Sinkovich um, had, had kept these and just kind of out of a desire to, um, you know, preserve the history, I think. Uh, and I mean, cause it's an amazing, amazing uh, collection for researchers. Um, cause you, we don't have this kind of information on sex workers anywhere really. It, it's, um, it's very significant. Um, and so what, he ended up doing, Mitch, Mitch ended up finding them because um, Sheriff Sinkovich's wife had saved them as well and after, after Sheriff Sinkovich died. And then, because um, she couldn't bear to like let them go or burn them, which was what apparently um, Sinkovich wanted her to do. Uh, and so then she gave them to Mitch, um, to the Sheriff's Department, and then he brought them to the Mining Museum. Um, and. What's really cool is you can also see other towns that were on the circuit, um, the so-called circuit. Uh, so Wallace was not alone at that time in, um, in regulating prostitution. Part of what made Wallace unusual is that it lasted so long, but, um, but up until uh, the 50s, even into the 60s in a few, in a few places, um, other towns were also kind of doing a similar thing. So you can see, um, you know, in Cleelum, Washington, which was also a mining town. Um, they did the, um, the charge reads INV, and that just simply means investigation. Um, and it means they just, you know, fingerprinted and mugged them and um, released them. Uh, Seattle, Washington, you can see that they were actually kind of prosecuted. In LA, they were listed as transient or um, vagrant in, um, in Burley is also another code word often for sex work. Um, and so you can see all these different towns, which were, um, you know, mining towns, logging towns, uh, Troy, Montana was on uh, earlier screen. Um, so you can go through and kind of track where the circuit was. Um, there was organized crime uh, out of Great Falls. And so a lot of women um, had ended up into, into the profession through organized crime. Um, in Wallace, you did not have to have a uh, sponsor as, uh, from a, you know, organized crime in, in any way. You didn't have to have a pimp as a sponsor. Um, but in a lot of other towns, that was kind of how it worked. Um, so Wallace was actually uh, freer for the women um, to work, although I'm sure it still, you know, um, had a lot of problems. We can uh, read about some of those in this. Um, there's another interview here with a woman. Um, who talks at length about um, being cooped up in the house all the time. They weren't um, supposed to solicit on the streets. Uh, that was uh, basically to kind of like have a distinction between polite society and um, sex work because it's such a small town. 
um, although it was quite downtown <laughs> where the location was. Um, but so they had rules and those rules are kind of covered in, this is a great little article. Um, Diane Simmons wrote it. I, she emailed me um, and talked to me about how young and naive she was at the time of writing this, but um, it, it must have been quite a pleasure to talk with Dolores who had this amazing sense of humor. She, she saw the um, examination before um, as a social service, <laughs> you know, where they're looking for VD, um, what they called VD back then, rather. Um, and Dolores said, you know, they get paid for doing for men what other women do at the, on the surface, at least for free. So who's exploiting whom, you know? Um, the, there's the idea that, um, you know, and we heard this in the film, uh, that women would be raped or, you know, sex workers were necessary to protect the safety and virtue of other women. Um, and uh, this one is great. Um, May former Mayor Keller uh, says, um, he starts out by saying, uh, with the belligerence of a man who has had to defend his position many times, if you can't wipe it out, you're smarter to regulate it. Um, it goes under the name massage parlor in other cities. And I love this line. Girls who can't meet Wallace's standards go to Boise or Spokane to work. <laughs> and there was often this setup uh, distinct, distinguishing, you know, how sex work worked in Wallace from other places. Uh, Southern Idaho gets brought up quite a bit, you know, with the, the moralizing that happens in the Mormon South. You know, um, so uh, I saw Robert has a question. So Robert's bringing up this notion of, uh, they call it um, bulk, the volcano theory of men's sexuality, <laughs> that it's gotta, go, it's gotta go somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. And some of the best archives that I found were these um, uh, forms that got distributed to, to soldiers and sailors during World War I, because this was seen as a huge problem for our military preparedness before um, we had penicillin, right? Like, um, you know, syphilis and gonorrhea were like real, real big problems um, before that. And so they ran these public health campaigns, you know, warning soldiers about, um, about you know uh, venereal disease as they called it at the time, and um, they you know kind of likened um, towns like Wallace to uh, some kind of like cesspool of disease, and you know it, it's funny like it's 
it's strange now that we're, you know, kind of in a time where we've all gone through a public health crisis. That was very much the case also 100 years ago um, with sex work um, as well. And it's kind of hard to keep that perspective in mind because, you know, we do have penicillin now. Um, but that was definitely a big, a big concern and what shut down most of the red light districts um, as, as well, besides Wallace. Here's the menu that you're referring to. Uh, Robert. So straight, no frills. This is from the Oasis Museum. There was one attack that was in Dolores's. Uh huh. Um, half and half, you uh, might be able to figure out was um, oral sex and then traditional sex, straight French. Um, that was how they referred to oral sex because the French were so scandalous. Um, with their oral sex practices. Um, <laughs> and then it goes on down to the bubble bath, the much lauded bubble bath, which um, if you had a bubble bath, people uh, remembered that. Um, I was talking to uh, Terry Douglas, who he, he, was very, he was very private about what happened during the bubble bath, but it was um, an event to remember. <laughs> so. Is that someone said, well, they've got the high school has some sort of laws, and so I went over to the laws and went into their music band room. You can't believe the number of unbelievable instruments that any high school band director would have done anything for. I guess a basketball county, this district of four dollars districts. And I said, Oh, the girls get them to us. Yeah, so yeah, so. That actually kind of leads into a question about uh, what happened to the community when the uh, houses shut down because they were so generous, uh, you mm -hmm. know, what, what happened to the band yeah. na now and social programs <clears throat> and other activities that they sponsored. Right. Yeah. So Robert was talking about how, um, how really how lucrative uh, the industry was for the town of Wallace and how it, it really impacted us when it, um, when it ended. Um, you know, I, I feel like, so we've had problems with our city pool for the last four years, three years or so. And um, I, I believe that if, if the madams had been around still right now, that we would have had kids swimming right away, <laughs> you know, but instead it took a little longer but, you know, Wallace people still, they come around. Um, unfortunately, I feel like um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the mining riches um, actually, you know, kind of went to these foundations that are now based out of Spokane. Um, and uh, some of it's coming back to the community uh, in the form of scholarships and uh, community donations. Um, but like Inovia, um, I think, but, you know, it would be, it would be nice if some of that, if we had some of those resources available now that we used to. And there's a question about how uh, receptive outside of Idaho that the documentary film has been. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? I we've played it for packed houses who just, I mean, they just loved it for the most part. I think we've only had maybe like one audience had some negative reaction. When was this? I think it was in Crested Butte, um, Colorado, which is similar to, um, you know, Northern Idaho in some ways. Uh, but a lot of that, I think, comes, a lot of the negative response, I think, comes from the raised awareness that people now have of the problem of sex trafficking. And a lot of people confuse sex work with sex trafficking. Of course, you know, back then, um, there were not as many opportunities for women. And so a lot of them did end up in the profession because they didn't have other options. One woman, you know, was talking about how she had kids 
Um, and so, you know, she had to find a way to take care of them. She wasn't a fast typer. Um, people, you know, just didn't hire women as much for as varied positions. And they expected that they were, you know, going to have um, a paycheck from the husband that was providing most of the income for the family. But if a woman didn't have a husband, then things were very difficult, um, monetary, and then they could just make a whole bunch of money. Um, and so that was, that was how a lot of them um, ended up in it. Um, and but you know, nowadays there's more options, but still some women are choosing to be call girls and sex workers. I talked to a woman um, out of, who works out of Seattle and she was visiting a gentleman in Sandpoint <laughs> at that time. And, um, and she was saying how much she, she enjoys it. You know, if you have to do a job, she, she, liked, she liked the job. So there's all, <laughs> there's all sorts. Um, but yeah, for the most part, everyone has, has been pretty receptive. That's all I've got for questions online. Oh, we got one more in the audience. Is your research when it comes to illegitimate children from the Um, we got to repeat it. Oh yes. Okay. So she's asked if uh, my research came across any illegitimate children from the ladies. Um, yes. Um, legitimate and I I talked to both legitimate children and illegitimate children or a story about um, a man who apparently grew up with a sister in the same school uh, that he didn't even know was his sister because his and it didn't come out until later that his dad had kind of um, you know had had you know another dalliance result <laughs> I guess um, and you know I think I don't know if he if he even ever um, met that person to this day, or if he just found out about it later. I can't I can't remember exactly. I didn't include it in the book, but we did have a conversation about that. Um, and I know that it um, it definitely impacted some the kids, um, even if they um, even if they were sheltered to some extent. So uh, that is certainly you know something. I mean, it is definitely an unfortunate reality of, of the business. And I think one that's unavoidable that, you know, it, it impacts the kids in, in some ways. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, Ms. Kuntz, who you heard in the documentary. Um, so one of the girls who I went to school with, she was a, a granddaughter of, of the madam of the you and I rooms. And she brought the kids in to register them for school. Um, she was taking care of them instead of mom, who was, you know, not available to. And um, Kathy, Mrs. Coons asked, asked her if she, you know, needed free or reduced lunch. And she goes, um, you don't know who I am, do you? And she like flashed. And then all of a sudden, like, Kathy saw all these rings on her fingers. And she was like, I am quite capable. <laughs> you know, it was, it, was a, it was insulting to her that she wouldn't be able to provide um, for the grandkids. And um, so there's a, kind of like a different sides of the coin, you know, like a, even if the kids weren't with their mom, at least she was able to provide for them. Um, let's see. I see one that says backlash after the complete shutdown. Um, there was a lot of backlash. <laughs> so if you read some newspaper articles at the time, um, you can see how, uh, how much people were very resentful of the federal government trying to come in and tell us what to do. Um, some of which, you know, you can hear these cultural strands still through this to this day. Um, and which is again, one of the awesome things about history is we can understand better understand the present and um, make our future a better place. So I think that's all I've got. Yep, that's all you got. So Thank you. Thank you. You want to come steal the show? Oh, we got one more giveaway there, Dave. Oh, one more giveaway. Hey, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> what better gift? And that's going to go to Judith Salzer. Salzer. Judith Salzer, you get this. And uh, like I say, this is available in other places in town, but come buy it from the museum. 
a lot of great books down there uh, at the museum. And I read this, you know, when it first came out and I got my, my autograph copy too. Um, but it's really interesting. And it talks about the, the platting and, and what side of the street you had to be on. And it's a very fascinating book about, you know, that piece of history that is, they say is the oldest profession. Uh, I think there's probably a couple others that are almost that old, but uh, it was good. Um, I want to thank everybody out there. Thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for all the uh, technical difficulties and getting through all this. We really appreciate you. And we appreciate your membership. Um, bring your friends, your family, uh, out of town relatives, people you know, bring them by the museum. Uh, you know, tell them about the museum. Uh, of course, you know, the big, big thing was, you know, a year and a half ago when we moved to White House and where it is now and the plans for that are so exciting and the future of that uh, it was really neat my, my grandson who's eight um once this started happening i'd bring him down a couple times a week and i was kind of video documenting the move on both the old property and the new property and so he got to see a lot of this and we talked a lot about it and, and uh, he was down the day we moved it and you know the thing with me is I'm excited to think that one day that my son or my grandson is going to be standing in that museum telling his kids or grandkids, I was there the day we moved this house. And it's a big ways to go to make it what we want to be our, our dream for the museum. So we appreciate all your support that you can give us out there. And thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up. It's a Friday night. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, again, encourage your, your friends and neighbors, hey, join. If you can't donate, be a member. Get your quarterly newsletter because that is super fun because there's always great articles in there. And that comes out once a quarter. So we appreciate your support. Anything else? Jocelyn, Britt, we are good to go. Thank you so much from uh, the Human Rights Education Institute and the Museum of North Idaho. We thank you so much for your participation and hanging out with us. Have a great weekend.